Okay, so in this session, uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, a whole range of topics, um, ranging from uh, from all different areas, which uh, which is essentially titled in one big title, Lessons Learned the Hard Way. And I'll explain a bit, a bit about that soon. Uh, first thing, a show of hands, um, who here has worked with Node.js before? Okay, great. And MongoDB? Who here has never worked with JavaScript? At all. Does that exist? Okay, so great. So we, we're in a good place here. All right, so first a quick explanation about who I am. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I originally came from South Africa, Cape Town. Um, you can email me at work or my personal email. And my favorite quote is, if all else fails, read the manual. Now, meaning that, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Bit of background, so the last three years I've been working with Node and Mongo in production projects from small startups to, to a wide range of, uh, of applications, from uh, location-based applications to uh, normal websites. And currently we're working on the, the MinIO core project and we're busy making a package system for it. Right, so now it's after lunch, so I want to start with two programming jokes. The first is, always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. It's a good, it's a good thing to, to live by. And the second is, why was a JavaScript developer sad? Because he didn't know how to express himself. Okay, um, a bit lame, but you know, it's, it's appropriate. All right, so now back to if all else fails, read the manual. So why? Because one thing, you have to understand what's impos possible. You can't make something great or push the limits if you don't know what you can actually do. So you actually have to read and find out somewhere. You can't just start trying. And also you have to know what the limits are. If you don't know what you're not capable of doing, then you can't, you know, if you want to take a you know, 747 to the moon, it's a great idea and you can try and you can get high, but you're not going to quite make it. So read the, f the FAQs. Most of the time, someone else has asked the question before you. So it's a very good place to start. Browse through open bugs. Also, another thing, when you can you start on a project and you're working with a library, whatever it is, there's normally bugs that are open. So go see if there's a, a problem related to something that you want to do. And also read the release notes. So that's just introduction. Basically, for the last three years, I've been making lots of mistakes. Lots and lots and lots of mistakes. We have lots and lots and lots of projects. And through each time you make a mistake, you learn from the mistake and you try not to repeat it. And the whole presentation now is about some of the mistakes made and, uh, and I still make them all the time, but I pretend that I don't. Now, these are some other things I said. Read well, suffer in silence. Some basic resources from MongoDB references and limits. It tells you things that Mongo can't do. You know, some things that, you, that aren't possible, some things that uh, don't work in certain versions on certain platforms. It's important just to have a little glance through it. It'll take a few minutes, and you can understand a lot. Um, also, Mongoose, you know, read through, read through the documentation. Take, literally, you can browse through really fast. You know, things pop out, and you kind of remember them. Oh, it does this, does that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So now when you're working in your code, you have this overall idea of what you can do. Also, Node.js, what people don't realize is that there's a massive sort of API. It has a lot of built-in functionality, ranging from clusters, domains. We're going to get to that later. Um, it's file system. There are huge features built in out the box. You don't need to install any external packages. It's worth reading. Take a bit of time, drink a cup of coffee or two or three, and go through it. Also, if it's Express, there's a lot of things you can do. You've got to check the versions. If you use Express 3, Express 4, read through the notes, and make sure you understand everything. Okay, now, the reason why I'm going to briefly speak about schema design very, very, very briefly is because it's said in the, on, the, on the website that I was going to speak about schema design and also said I was going to speak about Mongoose and MongoDB. So um, I want to fulfill my obligation and speak about schema design. Um, schemaless versus SQL, you know, you have one, you have a schema, you don't have a schema. All right, so one thing is Google it. There's a lot of things which explain. There's two links which will explain nicely the difference between schemaless and non scammer uh, pros and cons, et cetera, et cetera. And just in case it's not clear, I just uh, copied a few different, uh, something from Stack Overflow I found, which is mostly relevant. Most of the points are still relevant. Um, some of the downsides it says for Mongo is also the size of the database. Sometimes it's a little bit bigger than MySQL for the same amount of information. Um, I can't actually read here. Yeah. Oh, 
also, you know, RAM, you have, to, you have to weigh everything. You have to say what I want to do, what type of data I want, how much memory you're going to need to use. You've got to look at the pros and the cons and everything. There's no such thing as the right choice and the wrong choice. Sometimes SQL is better for what you want. Sometimes no SQL is better for what you want. It's just important to understand what each one does, what the limitations are, and uh, that way you, you have the right starting point. No SQL is a way of thinking. It's not so much about the actual physical software that you're using. It's not so much about the database. It's not so much how about it works, it's how you think. When you start to plan for an application, for a website, whatever you want to build, you have to think, you have to st understand what I want to do, what are my needs, what are my limitations, how am I going to build these things? And when you, the way of working with NoSQL is a way of understanding that your data structure is different. Your data structure is this nice JSON object. It's something that you can work with. You don't have lots of tables, you don't necessarily have lots of joins, although you can you simulate that type of effect. But you have to understand what you want to try and do. You understand your data. It's the most important thing. Um, like I said, understand how you want to use the system. You know, what is the system for? Are you making an API where you're going to make a request and you return a JSON object? If you're doing that, Mongo is wonderful. Why? Because you can just store somewhere in the database the exact response that you want. You can do a request. You can get it. You return it. It's so simple. If you're using, say, for example, uh, MySQL or Postgre, you might have different tables, you have to do different joins. There's a bit of overhead, you might need to add some logic. It's important to know what you want and to pick the right solution. What, for example, what data is permanent? You have to understand, you know, is this data will disposable? Am I gonna use it in the long run? Is it something that's temporary? Uh, you know, what can I index? You know, you have massive amounts of data, you wanna kind of make a small indexable, but you have to understand what can you index, what can't you index, some things you can't index. Um, what I'm going to use to identify my data is there a unique key. What happens now when suddenly my database is growing massive? I have huge, huge amounts of usage. I want to shard. I want to divide my database over a whole bunch of different servers. You have to understand what is the key bit of information that defines your data and identifies uh, all your different data. What data do you use frequently? What do you use all the time? You know, you're always going to be using your users. You're always going to be using something. So you have to also have to understand what data you use a lot. Uh, what data do you, sometimes you write something and you're reading it millions of times and you never ever write to it again. Other things you're reading and writing constantly. You have to understand a lot about your use cases and also the most important thing is what don't you know. A lot of the time you'll start, a client will have a request. You're busy trying to build an application. There are things that you are that are unknowns and you have to always make sure that you don't um, design yourself into a corner. You don't create a scammer that's not going to be able to uh, grow with you. You have to understand that the things which are going to change and you have to work with it all the time. Drivers, okay, um, or do you mean ODM? So for example, there's, there's a misconception, so Mongoose isn't really a driver, it uses a driver, and the driver is uh, the MongoDB native driver, um, but essentially they have different functions, and this is a quote from the, from the MongoDB website, explaining you know, that it supports MongoDB native driver for Node.js is the main driver, and Mongoose is officially supported ODM, meaning that Mongo, Mongoose is what you should use if you want to, you know, it's, they basically have different roles, but essentially Mongoose uses MongoDB, just to understand what the difference is. Um, it's not that important in general if you're going to be, most of the time if you're using a mean or using a, um, you're typically going to work with Mongoose, but there are occasions where you want to work straight with a Mongo driver. Uh, Mongoose in a nutshell, it uses a Mongo adaptive driver, defines a schema and models. Uh, you can define your indexing, it has validation, you have all different functions you can use, you can reuse it, you can populate things. So we said, I said earlier that one of the differences between schemaless and say not, you know, and, and say SQL is that you don't necessarily have, uh, you don't have joins in Mongo. So Mongoose as, uh, as uh, Mongoose is basically provides uh, a way to simulate a join in, in, uh, in MySQL. Um, also has sort of like, you can have references and all sorts of things. It basically provides all the tools that you need in order to work comfortably with your data. So it's all very well and good that MongoDB provides this nice schemaless database, but you want to have a nice comfortable, comfortable way of accessing your data, and that's Mongoose. When not to use Mongoose, it can obviously, a lot depends, and also depends over time, um, you, build, you know, I've been using it for a little while, so I can't remember what's relevant to the current version, what's not. Um, sometimes things aren't supported. There was once or twice, you know, if, if something doesn't, you know, Mongoose hasn't implemented something that the MongoDB driver does. Um, sometimes for reading reproduce results, you make a MapReduce, you saved everything into this non, sort of like this 
object somewhere in your database. There's no set schema for it. Mongoose isn't always the most practical thing to use for it because sometimes you don't know the structure. Um, and also, for example, um, we worked uh, um, we worked a lot in terms of actually converting data from MySQL, meaning Drupal systems, to MongoDB in order to provide APIs. Now, in order to do that, we create very generalized functions that will read your MySQL and will create documents and create data. In cases like that, you don't actually have a set schema you can use. It's sometimes it's easy just to say, you know, do a couple little, you know, you might know its name, you might know nothing about it. Mongoose isn't always useful in, that, in those regards, and it's sometimes just simpler to use the native MongoDB driver. This is also something which is interesting to, to know and is also useful if you ever do need to use the MongoDB driver. Always start using Mongoose if you can because it gives you a lot and helps you a lot. But if you look inside the Mongoose object, that you see we have connections and inside the connections you see we have db little object there now that basically allows you to that that db object is the native mongodb driver and you can use uh, functions in it so if you ever need to you can just access it that way you don't need to have a separate separate connection although you may have multiple connections all right now dev must equal prod Right, now, this is like a very, very important thing. So sometimes you're developing and like you know, one person's working on a Mac, one other person's working on Ubuntu, someone's got a little CentOS server that they're running, and you make something and you want to put it up onto your dev server, your production server, and suddenly things don't work, things start going wrong, because your developed environment didn't accurately reflect your production environment, which is basically the continuation of the, re the rest of the, of, the, of the presentation, is how important it is and what things that we need to do all the time to make sure that we're working the right way in order that we don't land up suffering later. Um, also, there's a reason why I use a double equals, not the, not the three equals, uh, and there's a link to Stack Overflow, the difference in the equal signs in JavaScript. Okay, sometimes on my local machine, I use MongoD, it's not sharded, but my server is sharded and I have a shard cluster and there's certain things which, there's differences, there's certain fundamental differences. Uh, I might have a master-slave relationship I might have a single server, you know, my local, I might have multiple servers, and I might have latency issues, different number of cores and CPUs, uh, I might have problems with error handling, uh, the operating system might be completely different, it might be CentOS, Ubuntu, Windows, and um, disk space, you know, you, you can't always assume that you're going to have the same amount of disk space, you can't make any assumptions, permissions, you know, for example, you, you might run it as a certain user, but you have to make sure your server is set up correctly and also restart procedures as, as uh, in Lior's presentation you showed how you run mean for example using grunt or using certain other ways and production is not always applicable and you have to make sure that the way you run things in your development reflects the way you're going to run things in production to make sure you don't um, have issues later on. Sharded versus MongoD. So you might say to your boss after everything breaks yes but I tested it on my local and he's going to look at you and he's going to want to strangle you because your local machine doesn't reflect the production machine what do we mean? Charted versus not charted. As I mentioned before, you should read the documentation. Here we can see just a small little um, selection of things that work on a MongoD setup but won't work on a sharded setup. Um, and it's important to understand and to read the docs and to know what your limitations are, to understand how important it is to make sure your environment is correct. Um, you know, geo search won't work. You know, you have to use a different type of search. It's, it's not a big deal. You can get around all these things, but if you've now been coding away, um, it's only be, and you have a whole, a few of these things, not one, maybe two or three small different issues along the line, it's going to land up destroying and throwing the whole project off track. Um, set up a lo local sharded cluster. And I wrote it's easy even for non-system people like me, meaning like I'm not a system person, but you know, you can kind of just plod your way through some, you know, th some walkthroughs and you can actually create on your single machine uh, a simulation of, a, if you have, a, assuming you have multiple cores, you can create a simulation of what you would have in production with a real sharded server. Um, and that way you can create a better proof of concept, you avoid unexpected surprises, and you understand performance-wise, and you get basically you have a very, very, very close representation of what you can have in production. And that's why I said two equals, not three equals. You're not exactly production, it's close enough to production that you shouldn't have too many surprises later on. Here are two tutorials uh, which will walk you through how to set up locally or on you know, cloud servers um, a sharded uh, MongoDB um, setup. Master slave. So we had a situation once. Oh, here's a scenario. I even wrote it. Um, you know, you build something and it's working really, really well, and it's now reaching its maximum. And 
you have to now create multiple instances of this. So IT sets up a slave machine for you. Or alternatively, um, you have a, you have a, okay, that's one, one example is enough. Um, so basically everything set up goes well, IT put your server up, things are running, the slave database is there, you get it, you know, you get the mail saying, okay, look, everything's ready, put your code up, let's get things going, and it's like kind of, a, let's have another server running. And you do that, and suddenly everything breaks, and you get the error not masked, and slave okay equals false. So, you know, what is this error? And you kind of like quickly go there, and you copy it, and you Google, and you see, ah, oh, you know, this error happens when you are trying to perform a request on a slave database that you can't do, for example, a write, or whatever it might be, or an update. And you suddenly realize, well, hang on, like, well, I was just trying to do a simple, you know, get. Well, how, how come I'm getting at this error? And uh, what's the reason? Because you did something that a lot of people did, and I did myself once, which is very bad. Um, but you have an issue, something slow, you have a slow request, and, you know, you need to create some, create some type of internal cache. So you build this little internal caching mechanism, you save some things in the database, you maybe pre-patch some information, you know, and it's really, really great. And it works nice in your local, it works nicely maybe in one server, but already in bold, don't do that. Why? Because now you're suddenly going to want to try to scale your, your application up, and now you're working on another server, and your, the server connects to the database, and the database is slave, and suddenly you can't write, and all of a sudden all this information that you assume you can have locally isn't there, and you can't write to it, and your application crashes. So what's the solution? There's a few. Two are you can use local databases or memory stores, meaning that don't save everything on the main database. Your main database is for getting information that you want. When you need to store cache data, use a local database or store limited information in memory, or you can have a, a dedicated service. For example, you have a process that runs, which only that process runs, which creates to the master database the cached information you need, and you can therefore pull that information off anywhere else and it's already available, and there's only one process who does it. He's the chief of that. Multi versus single server, Things to consider, you might have a thousand servers, okay, that's different to one server, you know, it's quite a big difference. Um, you know, well, how do you manage your sessions? You know, what happens if you're using a, a session store and starting your database, now what's gonna happen? And what happens if each server has a scheduled task that every 10 minutes will run an operation? Did you tell it which server to run on? Now you can have a thousand servers and all thousand can do the same operation at all exactly the same time and then you're gonna have, you know, a problem. Um, data relevancy, you know, how maybe that the data is, you know, it becomes irrelevant or out of date, you know, you, you, you're running a process on your one server because that's, but it's not propagated to your other servers. Um, one solution, this is a massive, massive topic, you could have a whole day on this itself, but the idea of stateless. Um, so sometimes stateless means that it doesn't make a difference which server you arrive at. You could come at server A, B, or C, or server 1000, um, you want to, for example, uh, the server knows how to deal with what the request you're giving it with just the information that you pass to the server without having any information stored in the database. That's the general idea about stateless, and a lot of people write about it and say they can allow you to scale and to grow and to, um, you know, to r remove load and database and all sorts of things. Mostly it's correct. Um, but there's two simple things that you can do which can help a lot. So sometimes we store uh, session information in a uh, you know, in a database or in, in uh, some other type of database, it makes it a little bit harder to scale. Um, you know, you can use uh, a stateless type of way to store session information or one-time logins. You know, you have send an email out with a login. You can, you can store all of that by using, for example, crypto. Um, now, this is something I wrote here in big warning over there. For demo purposes only, and there's actually two bugs in here, at least, um, which I, I know of. And, but the idea is simple. Let's say, for example, we're going to speak about uh, a one-time email login. So when you create a one-time email login, you might uh, hash information and send like your link with, uh, you know, come to this URL and you might have some token or something in it. Uh, you might have, uh, um, then you might need to look at information in your database to make sure it has expired. But you can install all that expiration, all the information like expiration time, which user is all inside the actual token and decrypt it. So we can use various cryptographical um, protocols. Mongo has a few built in which work quite nicely. And you can simply encrypt your information, you can decrypt it on the side, you can check that it hasn't expired. Um, and that way you avoid having to store information in the database uh, relevant to that request. Essentially what you're doing is you're making it stateless in inverted commas, because it doesn't make a difference which server it arrives at. You can send the email out from server X and you can the guy can click on the link and he can be accepted by server Y and it makes absolutely no difference and the database is not a fact at all. Something just important to consider, um, just if you want to understand the code briefly, let's have a look here. 
Um, essentially, we're saying require crypto, which is basically saying we're going to use a crypto library built into Node. Uh, we create a function called generate IV. You don't have to do this. There's different, there's different functions you can use for cryptography. This one is uh, just basically creates every minute uh, a random different, uh, different changing kind of a tumbler, if you want to call it. You have an encrypt function, a decrypt function, and essentially you can just use it by saying encrypt something, decrypt something. One thing I, which I just want to show here is, uh, is that this is kind of useful sometimes. Um, if you want to stringify a JSON object and encrypt it, you're encrypting a string or something, you can decrypt it, and it makes it nice and comfortable and useful for you later on. So it's not doesn't really give you anything much it, apart from um, apart from saving a few lines of code and, and allowing you to uh, to work in an object way all the time. All right, latency. Latency is is one of the big killers when it comes to you know anything when it comes to mobile applications, websites. It takes time for everything to happen. You know, I'm speaking now, and my voice is going to the microphone and coming at you, and there's a small amount of time until it reaches your ear, and then your brain processes it, et cetera, et cetera. The same with any application with any request. By the time it travels across, you know, the wire, it goes to a various network, there's, there's time involved in that. When you're working locally, when you're working on a, your own network, um, you don't feel the latency as much because it's, it's, it's still there, but it's much smaller. But the problem is you're going to suddenly now, you're going to start be going out into stage production. Things are going to slow down. Things are going to be not perform in the same way. So as simple as this. You can't avoid it, so simulate it. No one can avoid, if you can avoid latency completely, you're doing a, it's, it's impossible really to avoid it entirely. But you can mimic the type of latency you're expecting to see on your production environment. And, and to do that, you have a few tools. One of the tools is, uh, um, is simply to add onto your uh, local network card a default amount of latency and you can sort of add um, you know a certain amount of time and that could work a little bit other things which is more interesting which is more applicable is your application level so on your application level um, I think it's no jitsu made the node proxy module I can't remember I think it might be no jitsu they have a little package a little uh, NPM uh, module and allows you to create all sorts of type of proxy servers and a very simple thing, you can add a very, very small delay on, on, your ac on accessing your pages and it will give you a feel for what it's going to be like later on. Because the worst thing you want to do is to create f false expectations to a client or to your boss or to anyone and say, hey, look at the site I built. It's so fast. It's like lightning. It does this, does that. And all of a sudden, you kind of go to production. The client says, why is it so slow? Or why, you know, I thought this page used to load so much faster, what's going on here? And, all the, and now you suddenly realize that what you're showing there wasn't really a true reflection of, of what you've built. It's, it's, the, it's what you built on your local machine. And you want to try and get things as close to your can as production as possible. Number of CPUs and error handling. So everyone knows that Node.js is non-blocking in inverted commas, which is the famous you know, catchphrase on the, on the homepage. And it's partially true. Um, so let's say, for example, you have a developer and they're creating something and they're creating generate PDFs and it's using high CPU and it's going to be doing all sorts of things. And maybe that library uses the asynchronous li use another asynchronous library that forces Node to be asynchronous in certain ways. And essentially what's happening is one, using up all your CPU and number two, you actually are kind of holding up the, the, the event loop to a certain extent. And what your whole site's going to come to a standstill, it's going to crash. So the question is, what do you do? So, um, I read another one here. Okay, a second scenario which also relates is that you have, uh, you're creating a bug, you know, you've got a bug and the bug causes a certain process to break and it breaks catastrophically, it kills the application, all the requests that were currently open that hadn't been served will, will fall and everyone's gonna get timeouts and people are gonna be very, very unhappy and there's gonna be a lot of pressure on you to sort this out as soon as possible. Um, as it says in the Node.js website, don't ignore errors. So it's very easy to ignore errors, you know, ah, you know, I've got that little small error here, but nothing, you know, I didn't see too much going wrong, you know, but essentially what they're saying is that in Node.js, in when you have an error, it means something has gone wrong. You don't know to the extent that you have a problem. You just know that there is a problem and it's important to deal with it in the right way. Okay. Bit of background. Um, I just quoted here what it says from the Node.js website. Um, but we can, like I said, we can max out the CPU, we can destroy our single thread, we can basically do enough to create enough damage. Now, with solution, there's a few, there's lots of solutions. Um, you know, ideally, if you have a high CPU process or task, you wouldn't necessarily do it in Node, you can pass it off to a sub process, you can run, do a whole bunch of other things. But what's very, very useful um, is that Node.js has the idea of cluster. 
A cluster is essentially, it's something built into Node. Um, it's fairly stable in most things. You should always obviously check it. And, and uh, as I think as the, the lecturer from Wix mentioned that there's issues when you have sockets, you also got to make sure whatever you're going to implement it with, you're going to make sure that you understand exactly what you're doing and that is what the ramifications are. But in general, it's really great to get the most out of your CPU. Not only that, but allows you to use domains, something else we're going to get to in a minute. And it's, uh, it also means that one process that gets tied up won't necessarily pull down your whole system because inside the cluster, it essentially is a, a built-in balancer, which makes sure that you're, there's a, you're, kind of, uh, you're distributing your requests over, uh, over all the different clusters. So as a very really danger bit of code, this is copied exactly from uh, the Node.js uh, example on the website. We'll go through it briefly. I'll explain it, and then uh, we can see the benefits of using clusters and domains and how it helps us. So quick recap. The reason why we might want to use clusters is one, to get the most out of our CPU so we don't land up having a problem where one process is using all our CPU or breaks um, and we don't want to have a problem where we have an error. And when there's an error, our whole system crashes and we have... Uh, you know, we have everyone getting timeouts because this, the, we lost their request. We want to avoid losing requests. We want to avoid um, basically bogging down our single CPU. Right now, if we look over here, as a start, we're saying, okay, fine. We have, uh, um, we're requiring cluster. And we just, it's got a lot of commentary here. So I'd, I'd recommend looking at this also on Node.js website. We check if you have a master. If you have the master application, the logic's different because this is the main application. What we're doing, we do cluster.fork, cluster.fork. Every time you fork something, you're creating a different uh, process. You're adding another process of your, of your application. Now, there's uh, some nice little code that they, that they use sometimes. You can check, there's an OS module in Node.js. And OES allows you to see how many CPUs you have. So sometimes people implement it by saying, okay, they, they know they want to have two processes and out. So they do cluster of fork twice. Sometimes people want to do a loop and a fork of process for every single CPU they have. What does that mean? It means you have a single Node.js process per CPU. Which means if you have a quad core, you have a six core, you, have, you, know, you are getting the most out of your machine. If it's, that's the dedicated machine for your, for your Node.js server, get the most out of it. You know, use, use all your six cores and uh, distribute your load and, uh, and get your money's worth. Right, now we see that they have disconnect. When something disconnects, what does it do? It forks another one. So what, basically we have different events in the cluster. When a, someone cluster dies, it disconnects from the main cluster, we create another one. What does it mean? Every time one disconnects, one connects. So essentially we always have at least two clusters running. All right, now we are in the worker. What does the worker do? It requires domain. Domain is also something built into Node.js. I recommend reading up about it. It's very, very useful and it's, uh, it's quite a nice little built-in feature. Uh, we're creating a normal HTTP server, you can see here. So far, so good, nothing normal. And we do domain create. We're also seeing on error. When there's an error, we're gonna do some logic. What logic is he gonna do? He's going to set a timer for a certain amount of time and he's gonna, after he's gonna kill the process that had the error. So why does he do that? Okay, let's just say, for example, most of the time the average request takes you know, a, few, a few milliseconds. Maybe it's gonna take a few seconds. After say 10, 15 seconds, most of the outstanding requests, you can be sure in most cases uh, on the very simplistic level have already finished. So essentially what you're doing is say, look, I had an error. Whoops, there's a problem on this error. I need to do something about this. We know that when Node.js has an error, sometimes things aren't stable. We can't rely on the, on the state. We know we want to do something. What are we going to do? Okay, we're going to just, you know, we're going to kill ourselves. You know, we know, you know, we're going to kill ourselves and make a new one, but we're going to wait. You know, let's not do it yet. You know, let's finish to serve all our clients, give them back the information they want, and then we're going to do it. But you'll notice just after the certain, as soon as the timer is set, we unref and we close. What does the close do? The close says to our cluster, hey, don't give me any more connections. I don't want any more. I'm going to I'm going to be terminating myself soon. I want no more, no more, please. And what's going to happen is now the time's going to go by. He's got no more requests. He's dealt with all the existing requests. He's going to terminate himself. And it's but already on this disk on this close, he's already disconnected. There's already someone taking his place. So now you have your extra process taking place of this previous process, and he goes and destroys himself afterwards. And what do we do when there's an error? As you can see here, cluster disconnect. We send an error saying, "Oops, there was a problem." 
Okay, so the person who made the request, which is problematic, which broke for whatever reason, gets an error message. It can't be avoided, that's what happened, there's an error. But for everyone else, life continues at normal. And that's the advantage in a nutshell of using domains and using clusters. Um, it's definitely recommended. You can get a lot, a lot, a lot more performance out of it. You can prevent downtime a lot. You can also use clusters and domains if you want to do, for example, you build your own type of continuous integration. Let's say you want to upload a branch or a tag and you want to do a restart. Every restart, there is a small amount of time that you take to do this restart. So what you can do is you can, every time you actually will create a new spawn, a new process, it reads your code from new. So it allows you to do sort of hot code uploads and it's quite useful if you want to avoid downtime for, for a project which is very, very critical. Logs are important. Okay, before I go into the next slide, I'm gonna put, there's a bit of code I'm gonna put up which is very controversial. Um, and I put it there because I like it, but most people won't like it. So I'm just, that's the, that's the word of warning in advance. So just bear that in mind when you go to the next page. So logs are, are very, very, very important. You have to know what went wrong. You have to know what went right. You have to know, you have to understand what's happening on the system. So organize them properly and make sure they have timestamps. Let's say you do a log and you do console.log. Wonderful, okay, you've printed some text out on the screen, but you have nothing more than that. When was, it, when was the console log happening? Did it happen yesterday, today, six months ago, two years ago? Now you just say have you, you're gonna now tail your log, you're gonna catch your log, you're gonna download it, whatever you wanna do. You're gonna read your log, and you're gonna have a whole bunch of text and it means nothing. You wanna organize it nicely. So one thing is use colors. Okay, this is, you know, a bit debatable, but you, you have a module called colors and you can add colors to your, to, do, to your logs if you want to, or anything you want to display in your console. You can make it blue, white, red, if there's errors, whatever you wanna do. How do you use it? This is the controversial part. So just, you know, don't judge me too much, but it, I like this actually. So what you can do is that if you look inside Node.js, um, what uh, your standard, what you actually console log is, it's a standard out. So if you really want to, you can override it. Now it's very, very controversial what I'm saying, and most people will probably attack me for saying this, but I like it. Um, so what I often do is I'll, you know, add a little log time function. I'll print console logs. I'll maybe, you know, if I depending on what type it is, I'll change the color. So now afterwards, I want to read my logs. Let's say I just do a normal console.log. By default, it's debug. It will come up in blue. It will show me the timestamp. It will look nice and pretty. If I have an error, it will automatically come up in red. It will do all sorts of nicer things. So when I read my logs later on, even if some other application did a console log, let's say, for example, an external module now logs an error or log something, it will automatically print nicely with a nice timestamp so I can review my logs later on and I can process them and understand what happened. Um, separate error logs. Error logs are nice to have somewhere separate. Sometimes you have a lot of logs, put your error logs somewhere, somewhere else to the side, another file, and that way you can, you can leisurely go over them all in one place and it's a, it's nice, it's a nice thing to do. There's actually a little, some tricks which I had to do one time. So we had a server running and we didn't control the servers or the hosting. And we had constant problems, it always crashed. And the IT guys always said I had a bug, and I always said they have a problem with their server. And there was always this constant, you know, who's right? And the end of the day, the client just says to you, look, you know, we want our site to work, we want this to work, you know, I don't, we don't care what's the problem. So I decided to be defensive about it. So I added every time I have an error in my console log in my domain, I'm gonna spawn using the Node.js spawn function, a whole bunch of functions on the server, I'm gonna print in the log. One is a you know, load average, I can see what's going on. Mongo stat, you know, I, I'm past it, the host I'm using, and which database, you know, uh, uh, the ho and how many lines I want. For example, this line over here, if you do Mongo stat, this is good to do in your console anyway. You can specify the host by default, I think will be your, your local, your uh, the default port. Uh, but I can specify which host I want, and I can tell how many lines I want. So I can say, I want, I want the last, you know, 100 uh, lines from m my Mongo stat, the last 100 records. So that will also show me what the state of the database was before the error happened. Um, also, what I can do is I can see net stat. I can see, let's see how many, um, how many things are connected to whichever port I'm using. Let's say, okay, I want to find out, you know, like how many connections I have. Maybe there's like a problem, you know, maybe, maybe there's a problem with my connections. I can see W, you can also tell me, you can see information about who's working on the system, uptime, you know, there's all sorts of commands that you might wanna do. And it's kind of a, it's kind of like a little trick on the side. And also if you de try to debug something, there's a, it's really useful to get a really nice snapshot of exactly what's happening on the server, what's happening on the database, any command that you can, that'd be useful to you, you can use. And I actually have a little library uh, which I made for myself and I've called debug. 
And when certain errors happen, I just run a whole bunch of these and I'll um, push it out to uh, have inside the callback function over there. I'll normally use one of my special consoles uh, for pushing out errors. And afterwards, when I have an error, I can check in my error log, the timestamp, and I can also then see all these extra metric metrics that I had um, and helps me a lot. All right, we're running out of time. Operating system, um, it matters, right? So a small example, Node.js, you build things in some modules, build things in C, C++. Every system works differently. You can't take for granted that something works on Ubuntu is going to work on CentOS. You have to check everything and make sure you understand everything fully. As an example, I tried to build something once with uh, NPM, and there was a space at the end of the line. And the guy used Windows, and the end of the line space wasn't recognized by Python 2.7.3. Okay, problem. So we had to deal with it. We had to either upgrade Python, or you had to uh, you know, delete that extra end of line in your, uh, in your build file, in your GYP file. So those are simple things which you have to always make sure that you understand everything, you understand versions. Okay, so I explained what happened already. We're going to move a bit faster here. What's in a name? Also, Windows, the, f the naming convention is different. Linux, you can't use certain names. Uh, on Mac, names are different. Just simply naming your, your collection, it might work well in your local. doesn't mean it's going to work on the server. Read the docs. Bits matter also. Again, everyone knows that you know a 32-bit uh, system. You know, when you know two megabyte, two gigabytes is sort of your limit. Is it what you're going to do in, in terms of Mongo-wise? So always make sure that you understand um, what your limits are, and then on your and then on your um, your server, you have the right uh, the right uh, CPU, the right number of bits, disk space. Okay, so we had an issue a little while ago with uh, running out of disk space. We had collections that were growing and we had lots of information. Um, so the suggestion was, let's just cap everything. What's a cap collection? Selection so saying, look, we don't wanna have more than 5,000 record, 5,000 documents, or we mustn't go more than 10 megabytes. Okay, you know, it sounds nice. You know, if you look in the documentation of MongoDB, you know, there's this convert to cap thing. You know, you can just tell it the information that you want. And you look at Mongoose and it says, hey, look, you know, you can just kind of, in your scammer, you can just specify all this information and everything looks really wonderful. And you think, great, I'm going to cap it. It's going to fix all our problems. We won't need to worry about running out of information. It's all wonderful. And then what happens? Um, you discover, okay, well, we got a sharded, you know, our database is sharded. Okay, so convert to cap doesn't work. So what do you do? Script yourself out of trouble. And this is one of the, I think one of the, the least used features which should be used more is scripts. Um, you can run scripts through your Mongo shell. You can run them on your actual database. There's very low latency. It's quick. It's easy to use. Uh, you don't need to make application changes. Scripting is very, very good. I recommend also looking at scripts on the Mongo site. Um, also, you, everything's now good, and you get the errors. Can't remove cap collection, failed update. These are all the errors you're going to get if you have try to do certain operations on your cap collection. Let's say, for example, it was capped. You wrote a script to fix things up that you could turn a collection to capped collection, and now you are going to do operations, but you want to do a write or an update or delete. It's not permitted on, on a collection. And here's an example of the, I tried to create a, what the pizza collection, and I created test one, and I changed, you know, I changed the certain values, and you can see you can't remove and you can't update certain values in the capped collection. So it's not suitable for all different type of uses. Um, it's useful for when, um, if you want to have a very small amount of data that you don't need to read and write and you want to have it very, very fast, cap collections are good. Um, also, what are, what's very important is cap collections is an application level, not just the infrastructure level. People think making a change to the way your collections are structured has got to do with infrastructure. No, it's the way of thinking, it's a way of designing application, it needs to be designed from the beginning. Permissions, whoever's done that, raise your hands. Shame on you. <laughs> File structure is important. Make sure that you separate your files in the right way so that you so that you can change your permissions easily. For example, this is bad and better. You know, you essentially don't have some individual file you might want to write by something in some server side code. You know, have all your files that you might want to write separately so that a certain group or user can write your files. And um, don't on your local, even if it's your local and it's tempting, don't make everything, you know, like chmod 777 because what's going to happen is you're going to forget about it and you're going to wonder why it doesn't work when you're running it on a different server. Also, don't use sudo apt-get install. We have two minutes, so we'll do this fast. Um, it's not up to date. Uh, versions matter. Don't be lazy. It's very, very important. 
to always understand what versions work. And this is just an idea that I normally say to myself, it says disk, does it work? Are there issues that are open? Um, you know, what type of support I get from different packages or modules or external services, and is there community support? So meaning that now, we said versions matter, not only versions matter, yeah, it matters. Don't, you know, use a pre-alpha version or something that you don't really know so well, that even though it does what you need, it's gonna land a biting you later on. Always evaluate what you, ha what you use. For example, also in your, in your NPM package JSON, we see, for example, here, what's bad? Express latest, don't do that. Don't do that, you'll be very sorry, do that. Write the version that you want. What's gonna happen if you just write latest? Version four is gonna come out, it's gonna break your application, you're gonna install it on the server, and there's gonna be tears. Tips, npm help, use it. npm ls shows you all your dependencies. npm init will create a new package JSON. This is gold, gold. It's the most useful function you'll ever find. You have a massive function, lots of dependencies. Use it, copy all your dependencies. It will save you time and pain. Always understand your versions. Node version, Mongo version, npm version, Python version, you know minus A, understand what you're working with. I have more things here. Reminder, I said it's not up to date, and that's it. Uh, restart procedures, don't use grunt in production. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, there. Yes, it, yeah. it will create a new package JSON. It will ask you a whole bunch of questions. It will ask you about a whole bunch of questions. What I normally do, which is a tip I got from Lior, is I copy my old package JSON to the side. I make a new one and I just take out, you know, the dev dependencies that I want. Because most of the time I add scripts. I might have startup scripts and all sorts of other type of things in my package JSON. I don't want to lose that information because npm won't build it for me again. So what I want to do is copy to the side, use my npm init, get all my dependencies exactly perfectly up to date, and just copy that and stick it in my original package JSON, and then everyone's happy. And um, that's the that's the way that I do it. There may be a better way. Um, okay, half a minute. Uh, restart procedures, make an, if you're using Ubuntu, use an upstart script. No time for questions, but if you want, we can, okay, we don't wanna keep Amos waiting. The, any questions? No, nothing, Zell? Was that good? No questions. 